Well, hello and welcome back. Today I'll be working on a Corgi number 374 Jaguar E type produced around 1972. Corgi made several versions of this casting, with the early versions having opening doors along with the opening hood and hatch. This later example is pretty beat up, but it does have all of its parts. And you'll see here in a bit just how many parts this car actually has to lose. I haven't done very many Corgi cars on my channel, so I picked this one up to restore and also to showcase the powder coating process I've been using to restore these cars. The hope is that by the end of this video, you'll have a general understanding of powder coating and how we can use it in this hobby. But before we jump into that, let's first see how difficult this car will be to take apart. This car uses a hinge design and as such has almost three times the post to drill out. Fortunately, the size of the car makes drilling out these posts pretty easy, and without much effort, I can remove the body from the base. This is where the fun starts. These cars are really little puzzle boxes, some parts coming out with ease, leading to a false sense of confidence, while other parts are a complete head scratcher as to how they were installed in the first place. The hatch in the back is a good example. I struggle to get it off, and then decide that it can't come off, they must have crimped it. I then go through the entire restoration struggling with it on, and of course, when I go to put the car back together, the door just falls off. But I didn't see how it fell off, so I spent 10 minutes trying to figure out how to get it back on. Some diecast engineer somewhere is laughing. Anyway, after I do finally get it apart, I found that the wire suspension the car uses was definitely crimped on. Here I have a decision to make. I can leave it as is and mask the tires off and paint the base. I can cut the crimp suspension, or I can cut the axles. You can see which way I decided to go. Though in retrospect, I wish I had just masked the tires off due to all the issues I had rebuilding the axles. More on that later. So next I'll start working on some paint removal. I sprayed the body and the base down with aircraft paint remover, and as a sign of things to come, it had almost no effect on the paint. So I then turned to sandblasting to get it off, and even that was a bit of a struggle. I find this happens with certain old paints. Yellow, silver, and neon orange tend to be very difficult to remove, especially when they get on up in age. After the sandblasting, I then had to go over the entire body with sandpaper to even out the surface and be sure that all the paint was indeed gone. At this point, I can go ahead and prepare the parts for powder coating. I'll first start by making some wire hooks that will hold each of the parts. Once I have these, I will degrease the parts in some ZEP degreaser. The parts must be completely clean and free of all oils and dirts. If you don't have any ZEP degreaser, you can use isopropyl alcohol or acetone, carburetor cleaner, brake cleaner, all these will do the job. Once the parts are clean, I'll set them aside to dry. While the parts are drying, let's go over the powder coating system. Here I have the system made by Eastwood, though I also own and use a system from Harbor Freight, which is pretty much the same. These consumer level systems are pretty simple to use. They're usually just an electronic box with a bunch of wires coming out. One is a power cord to plug into the wall. Another is the button that you press to turn the voltage on. One is attached to the gun that supplies the high voltage to the paint. And last, there's a clamp that attaches to the metal rod you hang your parts on and supplies an opposite voltage to that of the paint. On the gun is a plastic bottle and this is what you pour your powder into. As one would expect, there's lots of powder booths that you can buy, or you can even use an airbrush booth if you like. To keep things easy and approachable, I'll just be using a simple box that I poke a metal rod through. I then attach the copper clamp from the powder coating system to the rod. Now that my parts are dry and clean, I can hang them on the rod and hook up my gun to an air compressor. The Eastwood uses 10 PSI max, and the Harbor Freight version I'm using here uses 30 PSI max. The parts I'm coating are really small, so I don't need anything close to the max PSI. With the air attached, I hold down the button and turn on the voltage, and pull the trigger of the gun to begin spraying powder. Since the powder has an opposite charge to the parts, it will be attracted to them and stick, the same way a balloon sticks to the wall after rubbing it with your hair. It is best to spray around the parts, and not directly at them, sort of like making a little cloud of powder around them. Once you can't see any of the metal shining through, the part has been coated. You can flip the part around if you like to be sure the other side is coated, but if you did a good job making the cloud, then the back side will probably already be coated anyway. Once you're done coating the part, you'll need to move it to an oven, one that you are okay with never using for food. I found a small toaster oven at a thrift store I paid five bucks for that works fine. 
Whatever oven you use, it needs to be preheated to 450 degrees Fahrenheit. You will then need to hang your parts in the oven and set the temp to 400 degrees and set a timer for 20 minutes. This is the time and temp that most powders use, but you should always read the instructions for whatever powder you're using to be sure of the cure time and temp. Once the 20 minutes is up, you can pull the parts and hang them to cool. So here's how the car turned out after it cooled off. You can see it has a nice glossy finish and looks pretty good. Now if you really get up close, you will see that the finish is not perfect, or not nearly as good as you can get with an airbrush and paint, but we'll discuss that later in the video. On a side note, I went ahead and powder coated the base with a matte black powder. Alright, so moving forward with the rest of this car, I need to fix the bumper and grill. The chrome has come off of both and needs to be replaced. To do this, I'll airbrush on liquid chrome. This technique works well with small parts like this bumper, but not nearly as well with larger parts. The issue has to do with the overspray messing up the chrome effect on areas you're not directly spraying. So you need to apply the chrome over the entire item in one or two quick passes. Go over with more passes and you risk drowning out the details and having to remove the chrome and starting over. However, once you get the touch, it's pretty easy. Dry time for the chrome is a good day before you can go messing around with it. And even after a day of drying, the less you touch it, the better. While I wait for the bumper to dry, I'll go ahead and polish up the windshield with some plastics polish by McGuire's. As usual, it does a great job in getting the windshield to look brand new. So now I need to put on new axles. As I said before, this turned out to be a problem, and I'm going to have to come back later and fix it. In short, I used brass rods to make the axles, as I didn't have the steel rod in the correct diameter. The brass rods are not sturdy enough to withstand the pressure of mushrooming. I can do this with smaller matchbox cars, but here the axles are just too long and bend under the pressure. So I did the best I could, and they are staying on, but I plan to change them out with steel axles I've already ordered. If you want to see this done correctly, feel free to watch any of my matchbox restoration videos. Alright, with the axles temporary in place, I can go ahead and put this Jaguar back together. While I do that, let's discuss a few pros and cons to the powder coating process as far as this hobby is concerned. First, the cons. One of the obvious cons has to do with safety. You're using a high voltage device that will have no problem letting you know you're playing with electricity if you mess with it. Admittedly, this is hard to do with the Eastwood model as you have to use one hand to turn it on and the other to spray. This was obviously done to make it difficult to have both leads in your hands and turn the device on and passing current across your heart. I should note that the Harbor Freight uses a foot pedal, so it would be possible, but highly unlikely you would make that kind of mistake. You should also be wearing some form of respirator to protect your lungs from breathing the powder, even more so if you're using my box method. The second con has to do with removal of the coating after it's been in the oven. If you're doing steel parts, this is not an issue at all. You place the part in the oven, cook it at the highest temp the oven can reach, this will burn the coating off. And when you pull it out, you need only wipe it down before you can recoat it. This works because steel and aluminum have a high melting point, way above the point the powder coating burns. However, the Zamac that these cars are cast from has a low melting point, and we're getting pretty close to that when we cure the coating. Attempting to burn off the coating would exceed the melting point of the Zamac, and you would open your oven to a little puddle of metal. So to remove it, you would have to sandblast it off. The last con I'll bring up here is that the surface finish is not as nice as what you can get with paint, if you know what you're doing. So really this is just a con if you're a master at painting. If you're not a pro at the airbrush or a paint can, then you might not see this as a con until you become proficient in those items. Now let's talk about a few pros. First, and the biggest pro for me, is time. It gives really nice results super fast. I did this entire car, from drilling out the rivets to screwing in the button head screws in less than a day. And most of the time was spent waiting on the chrome to cure. Normally for me, a project like this takes three days, with 98% of that time just waiting for paint to dry and cure. This was the first car I've ever restored that took longer to get the paint off than to put it on. Second pro, cleaning and changing colors is so easy. All you do to change colors is take the powder bottle off and blast the gun with compressed air. That's all you do to clean the bottle out. That's all you do if you don't like how the part was coated. Just blow it off and start over. Everything is done with compressed air. You never wash anything. 
The enemy of the powder is moisture, so you need to stay away from that. If you don't want to blow it off, then just use a shop vac to suck it up. Seriously, I wish I could clean my airbrush this fast. Third pro, it's extremely durable compared to paint. Not just abrasion resistance, but also chemical resistance. This can be used in all sorts of cool ways that I plan to explore in later videos. All right, so final thoughts. What you're seeing here is powder coating at its simplest form. I have not polished anything. I haven't upgraded anything. I'm not using any of the gloss top coats. It's what you can expect to get with a box and a toaster oven. Last, I'll be leaving the link to an Eastwood class on how to powder coat if you're interested in getting more info than what I've provided here. Anyway, let me know your thoughts below and I'll see you next time.